Hello everyone and welcome back to the School of Taste. I am Nick Jackson. Great to be back with you for another session, the third session in our study of understanding quality in wine. Um, one more to go after this one and I hope by the end of it we will have ticked off and discussed many aspects that you should consider when you're tasting a wine with a view to assessing its quality. Um, in the session two weeks ago, our first session, we discussed the way that um, hierarchies of vineyard quality in Burgundy can affect um, one, the quality of wines in one very famous region. And what I think we sort of saw was that gradually, as you went up the quality pyramid from Bourgogne Blanc or Bourgogne Rouge all the way up to Grand Cru, you saw an intensification of all the aspects associated with quality, like complexity, intensity of flavor, concentration, length of finish, things like that, that gradually they got more and more. Then last week, we stayed with the kind of geography question, and instead this time looked at a couple of different regions where there's one perhaps more famous or celebrated uh, wine appellation, surrounded by much larger ones. And what we discovered in that tasting, I guess, was two things. Firstly, of course, that for good reason, the famous appellations um, tend to produce higher quality wine. But also that somehow it can be a little unfair to say that the outlying regions produce lower quality wines because perhaps that they're not trying to compete with the famous appellations. Perhaps they're trying to do something different. And what I think we were suggesting was that in style terms, those wines may be trying to make a different style of wine to the famous app, uh, appellations to which they are so close. So to compare a famous appellation and an outlying appellation may not be the correct thing to do because they're trying to produce two different styles of wine. Now, during that session, a lot of you mentioned that when you were tasting your wine from Nebbiolo, the Barolo, or the Barbaresco, that your wine, while being very good, would be even better, or could be even better, if it had more age on it. If you're going to buy wine off, off the shelf, often um, it's just going to be a few vintages old, perhaps current release. And I think you guys made the very fair point that these wines would be better with age. And this comment about the association between the age of a wine and quality um, it's so important that I decided to dedicate a whole um, webinar to the subject. Um, and so that's what we're going to be discussing today. So welcome back if you've been with me all the way through. Welcome if this is your first live webinar and welcome especially if you're uh, watching on recording. Thank you for taking the time to do that. If you are watching live, please use the questions function for any comments or questions during the course of the webinar. So everything that I'm gonna say in this session is really based around the wines that I suggested you guys uh, pick up for this session, namely wines that have been aged prior to being released onto the market for sale. So almost as a part of the winemaking process, um, they undergo some form of longer than usual aging. So if you have a wine like um, a Sauvignon Blanc or a Rosé, or a Prosecco, you may be, one of your main emphasis as a winemaker may be to try and get that wine from the grapes to the finished bottle and out of the winery as soon as possible for all sorts of good winemaking region, reasons that you want to make a fresh wine perhaps, but also for commercial reasons that, you know, we've got cash flow at stake here. But other regions, um, especially those in Europe, um, part of the elemental style of the wine is wrapped up with aging prior to release. Now, I should say before we dive into all this, that a lot of the remarks um, I make today and we discuss today with regard to these wines that age prior to release are also relevant for wines that are aged post-release as well. So, you know, your Bordeaux, which is 20 years old or Barolo or whatever old wine that you have that you enjoy, many of the things we're going to talk about in the context of these wines today will also be relevant for those bottle-aged wines. It's just that it's harder for me to tell you guys to go out and buy 
all the same wine, all the same age or vintage. Um, so I thought I'd place the focus more on these pre-release wines, but also just bear in mind when we're having this conversation that most of what we say today will also apply to bottle-aged wines. Now, this is a lot of text on this slide for which I apologize. I don't think um, I need to go through it. All you guys are very familiar with all this. But in European regions, there are many regions, think about Piedmont, Tuscany, a lot of Spain, where there are uh, legal classifications about the, the language, um, the verbiage that you can use on a wine label uh, wrapped up with aging requirements. Um, I think the second bullet point is important. These categories, like for instance in Rioja, Crianza, Reserva, Gran Reserva, um, exist to give an indication to the consumer of um, what their expectations can be when they buy the wine. And wrapped up in that expectation is an assumption, I believe, on the part of the bodies that administer that longer aged wines pre-release are going to be better in quality. The reason I say that is clearly because for a winery to age a wine, whether in oak or in bottle or on the lees, is an expensive thing to do. And they're only going to do that if they feel like they can justify the expense of doing it with a higher price to the end consumer. And how do you justify a higher price by producing a higher quality product? So you can see I've just um, indicated here a few requirements for the uh, wine styles I suggested we look at today for uh, Champagne and um, for Montalcino, for Rosso and Brunello di Montalcino. I haven't mentioned on their Reserva. That would be another level of aging required. But just note, by the way, that you know the aging here is, in both cases, um, and it would be the same in Rioja, um, is about both any time spent in oak or any other vessel for aging um, and time in bottle prior to release. Often the two are combined in various different um, kind of formats. Okay, so I think we should um, taste some wine. I think it will make it easier for us to understand um, what I'm talking about. So um, if you have um, one or more champagnes, now would be the time um, to pour them. I apologize again that I know that acquiring wines of this level are expensive. Um, I know that it's it's a stretch. Um, and so if you've only got one wine or no wines, then I said it's totally fine. Um, but I do think it's good to look at these high level examples from classic uh, regions of origin because they, I think they are the best examples um, of the kind of things that we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to go through the slide, but you can start tasting. Um, and as you're tasting, my question to you is this, and please tell me using the questions function what your experiences are. But the question is, what are the elements of this wine that I am tasting that come from the pre-release aging of the wine or perhaps even include that in the post-release aging of the wine if you've got a wine with additional bottle age that's totally fine but just focus tell me what are the stylistic components of the wine many of which I, i've given you a hint i have listed on this slide you should be looking out for which of those do you perceive in the champagne uh, or other sparkling wine that you're that you're tasting today um, that's what I want to focus on because I want to. The first thing I think our task to do is to identify the stylistic contribution that aging can give a wine, and then after that, we'll talk about quality. But as you can see, all the elements on this slide really are the quality elements that we're familiar with from prior sessions where we've done that kind of quite analytical precy of quality in a wine when we look at concentration and complexity, et cetera, et cetera. Here, I guess we're focusing on three of them, which is really um, aromas and flavors, intensity, um, complexity, um, and some kind of discussion about balance, um, which runs into length as well, so maybe four. Um, so you can see that we've drawn these categories from the quality assessments, but they're also about the style of the wine. So that's what I wanna focus on. So please tell me about um, whether you experience these things in your wine. So starting at the top, um, let's just go through these bullet points to make sure we understand what we're looking for. Fruit. Um, fruit as an aroma or in a flavor is pretty essential, I would say, to any wine of whatever age. Personally, I don't like wine so old that the fruit has dissipated. I don't 
enjoy that. Um, I think fruit is an essential. Um, we'll come on to secondary in just a minute. Tertiary, tertiary flavors and aromas when it comes to sh uh, champagne or sparkling wine are quite difficult. So let's just spend some time to identify what those might be. What they're not is things like autolysis. That's a secondary thing, which we'll discuss in just a moment. But a tertiary note would be something about a note that only emerges as the wine ages and it emerges from the aging of the wine in, in no other way. So for me, when I think about champagne, often I'm thinking about things like the way that the grape varieties in champagne kind of break down and mature in the same way they would say in Burgundy or in anywhere else that produce those, um, produce those kind of characteristics. So um, in Pinot Noir, if you've got a Pinot Noir heavy champagne, maybe there's just a slight hint of spice or mushroomy or wet leaves or mulchiness, things like that. That might be a, a kind of mature Pinot Noir note that you get certainly in mature Burgundy and other Pinot Noirs from around the world. And you also get in aged champagne. Um, and in Chardonnay, it may just be the minerality coming to the fore a bit. So often in Chardonnay champagnes, you get some kind of chalkiness or salinity. And of course, those notes can be present at the beginning of the life of the champagne, but they tend to emerge more and more the longer the wine is in the bottle. Um, now, let's just talk about secondary winemaking uh, aspects and what I mean by that. So primary is fruit, tertiary is those age notes. Secondary is all the wine making side of things. So in Champagne, the most obvious one is gonna be autolysis, I think. Um, the aromas and flavors that emerge from the wine having spent time on the lees, uh, on the yeast in the bottle during the second fermentation. Um, This includes, and Michelle is asking about this, but this, for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to throw in there um, um, the way that wines are also blended in non-vintage champagnes. Uh, the contribution of uh, the contribution of things like reserve wines. So the reserve wines in the bottle after they've been blended also clearly undergo the autolysis as well. Um, we can talk about blending, we can talk about um, things like dosage, um, but these are things which I think are more of a function about the way the wine is assembled rather than a function of the aging process that it goes through. If you see what I mean, I'm drawing that distinction. I just wanna focus on the things that contribute to the age. Now, reserve wines are interesting, and I'm interested to see your comments about the difference between non-vintage and vintage if you have those wines in front of you because the reserve wines clearly are aged before they get blended. So that's an interesting component. Um, so um, we'll come back to that when you give me your comments. Um, the other one after autolysis, um, which I think is super important is oak in Champagne. Quite a hard one to taste for sure. Um, I think oak does two things in any wine, and I'm gonna include champagne in that, which is um, one, flavors and aromas of oak, okay? All the things that we know and love, I don't need to tell you, the vanilla, the smoke, the spice, all those things. Now, generally, I think that those flavors are less common in champagne than they would be in, say, you know, burgundy, white burgundy, or other kind of wines like that. Um, because I think that those, you know, those elements are often considered undesirable in champagne where you really want to maintain the purity and the integrity and the precision of the fruit. You don't want any of those powerful, overwhelming oak flavors to get in the way. But nonetheless, sometimes some winemakers like to have a hint of them. So look out for the hint of those flavors, the hint of oak around the edge of the wine. And talking about the edge of the wine, the other thing I think that oak contributes is to take off the hard edges of the wine. We're working here with, um, in Champagne, a very angular wine, right? A lot of acidity, um, the bubbles as well, but oak softens the edges of the wine. The same reason why winemakers might choose to make a still wine in at least a proportion of oak rather than 100% stainless steel. 
stainless steel gives wines with very hard edges, which can be great if you're making um, a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand or something, but it may not be desirable if you want a slightly more flattering style, slightly easier on the palate. And certainly that can be very useful in Champagne. So look out for that, but certainly a tough one to taste. Oxidative notes from aging. I mean, I'm re I was really thinking when I wrote oxidative notes more about the red wines that we'll taste later, which have undergone extensive oak aging, but it's possible that you might get some oxidative um, notes. You know, we can have a conversation about winemakers like Solos, uh, if we want to, we can go down that road. So there are some champagne winemakers who like to include just a little hint of oxidative notes that comes from aging, and the use of oak. Um, but generally speaking, I think that would be more unusual in champagne than in red wines, of course. Um, okay, so and let me just wrap up a couple of comments. Um, about bullet points three and four before I go on to your comments. Textural finesse is so important in aged wines, pre-aged wines before release and wines with bottle age. What it means, I think, is that everything is integrated. So it's wrapped up with balance as well. You know, we've had long conversations about balance in these sessions. Um, so the acidity, which obviously is very high in champagne, it's integrated into the fruit, it's not aggressive. Um, the bubbles um, feel natural and not kind of layered on top. Um, in red wines, we'll come on to that later, but of course the, the tannins are, are harmonious and maybe they've been softened with age and they are also a nice fit with the, the, the concentration of the fruit. So all of those things go to contributing towards texture. Um, and a good texture is often the result of a well-aged wine. And then finally, uh, the finish, uh, as always, Look out for when you're tasting, especially the difference between non-vintage and vintage champagne, whether you're getting all the primary, secondary, tertiary complexity all the way through the finish, or whether we're more on one note, whether it's more about the fruit or more about the autolysis. And especially, and this is a super important point, especially in the case of non-vintage champagne, whether you have a wine that finishes a little bit heavy on the acidity. Often um, non-vintage wines are totally delicious until the finish when suddenly they can be a little bit aggressive when it comes to the acidity. Um, and that's a key to me giveaway of non-vintage wine. Um, vintage wine tends to finish much more on fruit. Um, but okay, I've talked for too long, so let me uh, make a couple of, uh, uh, let me read out a couple of your comments. Katya, Tasha 2012, uh, delicious, I love 2012 vintage. Uh, it's much more complex with more aromas and flavors from the lees aging compared to the non-vintage. Uh, is is more intense but uh, less lasting mousse. Okay, good. Good comment on the on the bubbles. I probably should have talked about the mousse a little bit more, um, but I'm glad Katya you gave me the occasion to do so. So Katya's comment about the mousse is very interesting. Um, she says that the non-vintage mousse is perhaps a bit more uh, open and easy to see and to perceive and to taste, but it doesn't have quite the, she calls it, uh, it doesn't last as long. Perhaps it's not so persistent. Maybe the bubbles are not quite as fine. Whereas the vintage wine, perhaps the bubbles are less, maybe they're smaller, maybe they're finer quality, perhaps less obvious in the mouth, but ultimately of higher quality. Longer aging on the leaves is going to contribute to higher quality mousse. Absolutely. Great point. So thank you for bringing that up, Katya. Um, and an interesting example of the way the non-vintage wine can be quite attractive up front, but perhaps not just at the front of the palate, but I mean outwardly and openly attractive and enjoyable. But perhaps in the final analysis, compared to the vintage wine, the vintage wine is more subtle, kind of creeps up on you a little bit more. Um, Interesting. Thank you, Katya. Um, Shengli, non-vintage, just got a lot of fresh fruit and dried fruit, um, subtle bread dough versus a 2002 vintage, more dried fruit, toast and brioche. So it sounds like both um, a greater quantity of the autolytic notes uh, in Shengli's vintage wine, but perhaps also more intensity of them as well. Good. Uh, Edgar? Um, 2005 vintage Hydesec has toasted notes that simply do not exist 
in the non-vintage blue top. Great. A very clear demonstration of what aging can contribute to a wine. We assume, of course, the non-vintage has been aged for less. It doesn't have to be aged for less. There's just a minimum requirement. You can exceed it as much as you want to. If you've got a Krug Grand Cuvée, the oldest reserve wines, and that can be you know, 20 years old. So that clearly is an example of a wine that's been aged for a lot longer. Um, Edgar saying the fruit is also riper in the vintage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so riper fruit and more uh, autolytic notes in the vintage. Um, uh, Lars commenting, the non-vintage has also got a more layered feel, feel to it, where the different aspects of the wine are more obvious while the vintage 2010 is more seamless and a sum of its parts. Yeah, great comment. More seamless gets to the, to the third bullet point here. I, I, I'm going on about harmony between all the elements of the wine. Everything's integrated, bubbles, acidity, fruit, um, any winemaking secondary characteristics. And all of that is contributing to more of a textural, what I call textural finesse. Textural finesse kind of means an effortless texture where it's not like one thing over here and one thing over here, but somehow everything is just wrapped up well with one another. Um, okay, Michelle, um, the Rotor and non-vintage has got more bruised apples and fewer autolytic um, versus more purity of fruit and more autolytic in the vintage wine. Actually, I'm really, really glad that someone is going to be able to do this comparison with Rotorer because Rotorer is someone who, uh, even in their vintage wines, they don't like too much autolysis. Um, some of you who know Jean-Baptiste Le Caillon, the, who I think is a genius, a genius winemaker at Louis Rotorer, he massively is interested in organic biodynamic farming and absolute purity and quality of fruit. Um, and so even in the vintage wines, I find them to be not as autolytic as some houses. Um, because the, I think his style is more about the absolute clarity of the flavors. But nonetheless, Michelle's saying, Michelle's doing the comparison right there, more autolysis in the vintage wine. Um, good. Uh, Kirsten saying um, she has the same wine as Edgar, um, 2004 vintage though of Heidsick. Uh, the apple is more bruised in the vintage, um, but I agree with the comment of more brioche than pastry. And Kirsten's just saying that she does agree that the non-vintage ends on acidity as opposed to the vintage. Um, good. Edgar's saying the vintage has got a heavier mouthfeel. So Edgar, would you describe, using our sort of discussion about all those quality characteristics, would you describe that as greater concentration or depth of fruit? Um, or is it something else as well? Is it the layering of the different flavors, the autolysis and the fruit, or contributing to a greater sense of weight? Um, uh, Nupa, uh, 2013, much more savory and nuttier with a much longer finish. The vintage wine, more savory and nuttier. So nuttier, I would certainly put in the category of the autolytic notes. Savory is super interesting, isn't it? Um, if you think that all fruit, you know, Basically, we're going to say the sake of argument, you know, the fructose or sucrose, whatever it is in fruits, not in wine, but in fruit, when you bite it, there's essentially a somewhat sweet quality to all fruit. I mean, maybe we can argue about lemon or something, but forget about that. Even apples have got a slight sweet taste to them. And so if you're going to put all fruit notes in a, in a, in a vaguely sweet category, Michelle uh, Nupre, excuse me, is saying, that the non-vintage is away from that world and much more towards the savory world, as if the focal point of the wine isn't on the fruit, it's on the more savory characteristics, which to my mind would come from the secondary and tertiary uh, aspects of the wine, the winemaking and the development. Um, Bielka, uh, Bielka non-vintage. Uh, interesting wine because a lot of Pinot Meunier in this wine, or Meunier, I should say, excuse me, in Champagne. Um, and so it can be quite a fruity wine. Um, but let's see what Erica says. Uh, Bielkar is dominated by berry and ripe apple aromas and flavors. Yep. Um, I think that's the Meunier speaking. So a fruity wine, basically, for the non-vintage uh, Bielkar. The 2008 Bielkar, meanwhile, has more citrus, crisp apple, which is woven into the secondary and tertiary aromas and flavors. So a different profile of fruit, 
And also it sounds to me, Erica, that's probably like a different blend as well. So maybe a move away from the Mernier in the non-vintage and more towards perhaps the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir um, in the vintage wine. Um, Edgar just saying that the vintage wine has simply got more body. Great. Not necessarily a quality aspect. We're not going to say a wine is bad because it's got a light body. You know, that's a Mosul Riesling. It's not bad because it's got a light body, but it's really a style aspect of the wine. That's just the style of the wine. And Edgar commenting that his vintage wine has simply got more weight to it than the non-vintage. Good. Um, any final comments about these wines? Um, Shengli saying, um, does, um, going back to the, my conversation about Roderer, I'm very fascinated by Roderer. I think that Jean-Baptiste Lecayon is one of the great philosophers of winemaking, not just in Champagne, but anywhere. And Shengli asking the question, does he make all the vintage wines with less autolysis? Um, I think the whole style of Roderer is less autolysis, actually. Um, if you would compare the wines to something like a Ruinar, house, house style of Ruinar or Verve Clico, I would say that the autolytic notes in those wines are a lot more generous than in any wine from the Rotorua portfolio. Um, I think that there are, which brings up a good question about houses and house styles and things like that. Generally, I think that the Grand Marks will often feature quite a lot of autolytic notes. They enjoy that style of wine. Um, expressing those notes very clearly, especially in the non-vintage wines. And I think really the reason for that is probably to do with the fact that there are easy uh, and attractive flavors for the consumer to grasp onto. So if you're making 10 million bottles of Noet non-vintage um, or Verve Clicquot, you want to make a product that is appealing to a broad spectrum of people, that for wine geeks like us, we can taste the fruit and the autolysis and look at the, the nice bubbles and think, oh, this is a good well-made wine. But to the person enjoying that wine at an opening of an art gallery or something, they're like, oh, interesting, this wine has got more going on than Prosecco. And maybe they don't go further than that, they might think that, but the real reason is the autolysis. The autolysis adds that savory component we were just talking about and a bit of flavor complexity. And so I think that you do need those autolytic notes if you're a Grand Marc, I think, um, People enjoy them and you're making wines for a large audience. But if you're a much smaller house like Rodera, and especially if you're a, what I call a grower champagne, a small family domain, um, then you can be more adventurous with the style knowing that your wines don't have such a widespread distribution. So if you want to major on purity of fruit as especially an expression of place, if your wines just come from one village in Champagne or even a single vineyard, then you might want to make more, a more pure non-autolytic style um, in order to express the variety in the place, just like any other wine. Um, so yeah, I do think uh, Grand Marks tend to be more autolytic and growers tend to be um, less autolytic, perhaps because they spend less time on the, on the leaves in order to get that purer style. Um, Tufi, sometimes a non-vintage is more overtly autolytic than a vintage from the same producer, um, this being more austere when released, um, i.e. the vintage can be more austere when released. Um, could you comment on this? Yeah, so this is a very important point. Um, sometimes non-vintage wines, which ostensibly, according to the, all the you know, laws governing the appellations that I put up at the beginning, ostensibly non-vintage wines are aged for less time than vintage wines, although you know you can choose to short age of vintage wine and long age of non-vintage wine. But what is in non-vintage wine are um, wines, I guess a couple of things, and these are the kind of secrets of champagne to which I am not privy, but a couple of things. Firstly, if you're, if you're keeping, you can keep reserve wines for longer or shorter periods. Um, and of course you can, so you can have different age wines. So that would contribute to the tertiary complexity. This is the, the Krug point I was making, the Krug Grand Cuvée point. If the current release is built off a base of say 2012, but it's got wines going back to 1998, you're getting tertiary complexity from the, um, the Van Clare, which have been stored for so many years. But in terms of autolysis, secondary complexity, um, I think like I was just saying about the houses is winemaking choice. And this is where a sparkling winemaker would have to help me out. The extent to which you can manage the autolytic pickup depending on 
um, how you make up the blend that goes into the bottle for the second fermentation, right? The amount of yeast or what selection of yeast you use. Um, winemakers control all these aspects so tightly, but I think that's probably going to be where the magic happens. And again, counterintuitive, you may have more autolysis in a non-vintage wine because of a stylistic choice on the part of the winemaker, as opposed to because it's longer age, because it's not. So that would be my suggestion, I think, um, that the winemaker is just playing around with the way that they bottle the wines. Um, remember in a vintage wine, any autolytic pickup you have, which may be, as you rightly say, Tufi, may be more restrained when the, fine, when the wine is first released, has got a lot longer. It's gonna probably have a much longer lifetime in the bottle after the person has purchased it for those autolytic aromas to emerge in full bloom. Um, so we may still get those after release, but they're only gonna emerge later, perhaps because they were more subtle to begin with. They just need a bit longer to flower. Um, Shangri, do you see a biodynamic organic viticulture affecting the amount of autolysis decision-making in the winery? I mean, not really. Um, one's viticulture, one's winemaking. I mean, I, obviously you're hoping in biodynamic and organic to have particularly pure, clean fruit. Always difficult, many difficult vintages in Champagne. Um, but again, let's not get into this now because it's very complicated and frankly controversial area of discussion. But if you have um, thicker skins, uh, perhaps riper, riper berries um, as a result of going over to organic or um, biodynamic healthier berries, then you might have um, potentially um, different levels of phenolics, which is very important, um, sugar contents, um, fruit development, aroma and flavor development, things like that. Um, and that's all going to be part of the equation that you've got to manage when you're when you're making your blend to go in the bottle. Um, Erica Bilkar finishes more on the primary fruits and the sweetness. So dosage, you'll notice that I didn't mention dosage here because I don't think dosage is a, a function of age. You're not tasting the sweetness as Erica has just done because of anything to do with age. That's simply a winemaking technique. Um, but the 2008 Bilkar has got a longer finish with lemony fruit, autolytic toastiness, and tertiary notes of dried apple and fresh mushroom. Fantastic. Um, I think that's just a great description of the finish, um, the complexity from all those notes, which the aging has given. Vintage Gilcar uh, is extra brute with a, a low dosage as well. So again, um, someone was talking, Edgar was talking about the body of the, of the wine being a bit heavier. Uh, perhaps the fruit a bit more concentrated in a vintage wine. That means that there's going to be more generous fruit on the palate, which means you can reduce the dosage a little bit. Um, the counterpoint to that, and this is another controversial area that people get into fisticuffs about in bars after champagne tastings, is that generally we know that sugar is considered a preservative. If you're making what is trying to be a long aging, 20, 30 plus year aging vintage wine, you may not wish to reduce your dosage to zero um, because you may feel that that may impede the ability of the wine to improve with age. You may just want to retain a little bit of sugar, and I'm sure that's what's in the extra brew bill card, just a, a tiny amount. Okay, so I don't. Uh, we need to we need to move on to stay on schedule, but um, I think we've seen that these are the elements that contribute to um, quality differences. The superior quality perhaps of vintage wines are coming from these contributions about complexity of flavor, coming from um, both winemaking, but also the effects of age, of, of bottle age, um, textural um, elements um, and balance and better finishes on the wine. So, so important in a very subtle wine like Champagne to have a good finish, very, very important. Um, but the point, the final point I wanna make though, having said all these things um, is that these are not just winemaking tricks. Not all these things can be manipulated in the cellar depending on the way that you treat the, the champagne. Um, it's also to do with the quality of the underlying material, which in turn is influenced by where the grapes come from. Of course, as we know, ge ge geography, as we've talked about the previous two sessions, is such a key determinant of quality. Uh, geography, vintage, um, aspect, altitude, all those things we talked about in the context of um, when we were talking about 
the importance of site and of location. So don't ever overlook those things. And in reality, it's likely that vintage wines and luxury cuvées uh, will be the pick of the best vineyards. Non-vintage blends with a bit more autolysis, perhaps, you know, I'm treading gingerly here, but hopefully there's no champagne winemakers here, but you can use autolysis to cover up uh, fruit, which isn't perhaps as great as you want it to be. Whereas in vintage wine, you need really good fruit all the way through, coming from the best sites. Okay, um, we could talk about this all day. It's such a complicated subject, isn't it? I think that champagne making is the most complicated wine making there is. Every step can be tweaked. Um, but I do want to talk about red wines as well in the context of aging. So let us do a similar kind of analysis, a study of the two reds, if you have them. If you only have one, that's great as well. Um, I suggested that you look at Rosso, Di Montalcino, or, and a Brunello. Of course, if you wanted to do the same with Chianti or Vino Nobile, you can even do it with the Reserva and the Normale, as opposed to with Rosso, totally fine. Um, so please go ahead and, and pour those wines and taste them. And um, again, tell me about the influence of age, especially in the Brunello, in the higher, the longer age one. Tell me the impact that you're getting of the aging on um, um, pre-release and perhaps with any bottle age, if you've got an older example. Um, and if you've got a Rosso, then clearly the Rosso in red wine terms is not a long aging wine. It's, you know, one year uh, after the harvest, it's released. So likely it's going to be in whatever vessel it's in for, you know, nine months or perhaps a bit less before it's been bottled. But what I want to use it for, of course, is as a counterpoint to the longer age one. So hopefully it can really draw out the contrasts, what the aging is really contributing to the wine. So again, please tell me the same things. What do you think the, um, the aging components um, are contributing to the style of the wine overall and what the contrasts are? Um, as we're doing that and as you're tasting, um, I want to just talk about this slide a little because I felt the need to put in this slide um, as a kind of counterpoint to what we've just discussed, a balancing act, if you like. What we just discussed was all the wonderful uh, aspects that aging a wine, aging a champagne can give, um, all the interesting notes that you can pick up from age. And we were talking about that in the context of quality and how it may um, improve the quality of a wine. And indeed, we talked about the way that these appellations are structured, the, the, the terminology, such that aging should always result in a superior quality of wine. Well, I want to play devil's advocate for a moment and talk about the dangers of assessing aged wines um, in a purely qualitative way and things that you should always be thinking about in the back of your mind so you can make a proper quality assessment. Because here's the thing, you know, I, I'm someone who's had the fortune in my career to work a lot with fine wine, which means that I've worked a lot with mature wines, wines with bottle age, with Bordeaux, you know, which are not just 20 years old, but they're 40 years old or they're 60 years old and Burgundy is the same. And, you yeah, look, it's, I've been so fortunate to be able to taste all those things. But the number of times I've sat around a table with people doing a tasting like that, and everyone goes, oh my God, it's so amazing. But when you actually really do a proper quality analysis, the likes of which appear on, you know, the, these kind of categories that we've been discussing in the previous sessions on the left, these things about the kind of analytical information about concentration, intensity, complexity, all those things, sometimes people overlook them and give the benefit of the doubt to the, um, to the older wines. So I want to put these things out there, not because your wines are going to be bad or terrible, but just because you, whenever you're tasting older wines, wines with any amount of age, you need to think about these things as well. I just talked about the way that in Champagne, sometimes you know, the vintage wines or the luxury cuvées may come from sites with um, you know, the best sites, the best vineyards making um, ripe, high quality fruit. But that is not, doesn't have to be the case. And you can be in situations where wines quite obviously are made from less than great underlying material. 
Um, I'm thinking here about the fact that you can find in, I remember when I was back in the UK before I left to come to the States, you know, you could find Rioja Grand Reserves in supermarkets for, you know, 10 pounds and things like that. And so these wines have been aged for years before release and they're this cheap. And all that that makes me think is that you can, to a certain extent, if you're a, you know, you're a big producer, you're making a lot of volume, um, you can, you know, use your large scale to reduce the cost of aging. But what you can't do is really reduce the cost of grapes all that much. So if you are making really, really cheap wine that's been aged for a long time, the only place that I can think it comes from really is because you can't change the fixed cost of the aging very much. It must come from where you're buying the grapes. The grapes simply can't be that expensive. So it means they mustn't come from the best sites. And so in those kind of inexpensive wines, um, often what you get is fantastic, mature, mulchy, wet leaves, fantastic, mature aromas that are so you just want to smell them all day, they're so delicious. But then what they risk is really the second point, a lack of concentration. Honestly, when you do a real hard assessment of the wine, they're just not that concentrated on the mid palate. The fruit is just not that concentrated. The flavors, apart from those tertiary aromas and flavors, all the leathery, cigarry, tobacco notes, which might pour out of the glass, apart from those tertiary notes, the fruit uh, flavors and aromas really don't have that much intensity to them. And the finish is just a bit short in terms of the fruit. Perhaps it's longer in terms of those tertiary aromas. But like we said at the beginning, a good wine has got primary, secondary, tertiary. We can't just have tertiary. Um, so my statement in speech marks, maturity buys complexity, is a shorthand way of getting to this point. That we think we, we've got a real great complex wine because it smells so delicious and all these complex tertiary notes. But it, if it doesn't have the underlying substance, the concentration, the intensity of flavor, then it doesn't really matter. It's still not a good wine in the first place. Um, I remember when I was tasting off vintage Bordeaux, I think it was 2007 vintage. 2007 is a pretty kind of pedestrian kind of vintage, certainly one that you want to drink now. And the wine smelled delicious to me. You know, it was all the things that you hope for in left bank Bordeaux, all the graphite and the cedar and all that stuff. But my friend said to me, oh, Nick, the nose is bigger than the palate. And I didn't really know what he meant, but then I tasted the wine and the palate was just thin. There wasn't much concentration, not much fruit. Um, and the nose, but the nose was fantastic. And when you get a situation where the nose is bigger than the palate, that's almost like being out of balance. You know, something's kind of gone wrong there. Um, so it's very flattering on the nose, but really the underlying material is not that great. Um, so just think about that. And in the context of that 2007, which is certainly a vintage to drink on the younger side when it comes to Bordeaux, because it wasn't a very ripe year, think about whether the wine is showing well now, but it may not improve further. That was certainly the case with that wine. Aromatically, it was delicious, even if it wasn't that concentrated, but now was the time to drink it. It didn't really have the stuffing for further improvement with age. And any of these wines that we're talking about, whether it's, you know, Brunello, which is you know, has to be released five years after the vintage. If you're tasting your wine, your Brunello now, or whatever you have now, and you're thinking this is as good as it's going to get, in the context of Brunello, that might be a problem actually, rather than a virtue. Um, so I'm being very negative. <laughs> I know that. I'm being very critical about what these great mature age wines can be. But just don't be distracted by the maturity, especially in flavor and aroma terms. Do the proper hard analysis of how good these really these wines really are at the same time as you're thinking about, um, you know, what the age is contributing to the wines. Um, I've had, like I say, in my fine wine experience, just so many experiences where people are giving these wines more credit than what they really deserve. OK, um, Michelle. Rosso 2018, um, pure uh, red, cherry, and strawberry. Um, so pure fruits, no tertiary aromas, whereas the Brunello 2012, still some fresh red fruit, good. Um, but more dried fruit, leather, forest floor, excellent. So um, the, the fruit is still there. Like I said, fruit is a precondition for any kind of wine. 
but also what's great is you're getting the tertiary um, aromas from uh, aging. Do you get any secondary notes, any oak? I mean, oak would really be the thing, I guess. And what I was talking about, about the oxidative notes. Um, so in the context of these Italian wines, which can be aged for quite a long time, sometimes you get a bit of oxidation, just a very slight hint, perhaps in the dried fruits that you were mentioning, Michelle, maybe that that's it. Um, and perhaps in the volatile acidity, which can result from long aging in the, in the very slight presence of oxygen. A non-oxidative environment would be you know, stainless steel. But any time when you're aging wine in oak, there's always going to be the tiniest bit of transmission. Um, okay, Amiel's asking a question. Would you regard as a parallel of what you emphasized in champagne, better fruit, more phenolics, and age for longer in oak um, with regard to still reds? Yeah, all of those things. Um, I would also in reds be looking for good handling of the um, of the oak or whatever age aging you've done on the wine. Um, two years in oak for Brunello, and of course many extend that. So it's not only managing any oak flavors, which in most Brunellos, most traditional style Brunellos are quite minimal because it's large or old oak, but also managing the any kind of oxidation that may be a somewhat desirable style to have a little bit of oxidation if you're a very traditional style producer. But some other producers may want to avoid that, so there's no risk of VA. They don't want any of the dried fruit notes, they want more of the fresh fruit. And so either style can be successful, but it's just about how well managed that is. So that would be something I would add to that list. Um, Michelle's saying there's lots of tertiary on the palate, but the fruit is still there. So that's good, I think. So that's a sign of a good wine to me. Um, with 2012, so you've got five years aging before release, both in oak and in bottle, and then um, and, and another three years in, in bottle since release for 2012, but the fruit's still there, so that's a good sign. Uh, Edgar Poggione, lucky you, Edgar. Poggione is a great producer. Rosso and Montalcino. The Rosso is very nice with good secondary and tertiary aromas and flavors, but the fruit and the tannins predominate. Interesting that in the Rosso, so like a little baby wine, you still get a lot of tannins um, as well as a lot of fruit in, at this young age. Um, you know, Rosso obviously usually made in a less tannic style, but in a traditional style, I think Poggione is more of a traditional style. The tannins can still be there, um, but uh, Edgar commenting in the Brunello, the fruit and the tannins are in balance. So that's a really great point, which I hadn't really thought about, which is that, you know, one downside of not aging the wines like the Rossos, the, the younger wines, is that if you are making a style which still has got tannin, then you can risk the tannin still being a bit obtrusive, uh, even though Rosso is not a style associated usually with tannin. Um, Katia, Frescobaldi di Castel Giaconda. Uh, Rosso is light to medium body, mostly fruit, fruity, sweet and sour cherry, some peppery notes, fruit forward and simple. Brunello is medium to full body with complexity of fruit and oak aging, smoke, vanilla, redstone fruit, but no tertiary yet. Uh, okay, good. More intense and richer. Shows um, high quality. Good. Um, two fee. Coldorcha, Rosso di Montalcino. Um, Coldorcha is just not, I, I think my ultimate producer, Coldorcha, by the way, if anyone wants a tip. Coldorcha, the wines are still not expensive. Coldorcha is not in the stratosphere of Brunello producers in terms of price, but the wines are so, so good. Very pure. Um, versus a Brunello 2007. So 2016 Rosso versus Brunello 2007. Uh, the latter wine, the Brunello 2007, is complete. Ripe fruit, still intense and concentrated. Great. Integrated with cigar box, leather, vanilla toast, so secondary and tertiary. Tannins not as sandy as in the Rosso. Softer now. Softer tannins with a finer grain. Um, no hollow mid palate that I get in the Rosso. So perhaps that's about balance as well, all the elements coming together. Very long length and a layered complex highly satisfactory finish a beautiful wine the brunello versus a good quality rosso excellent excellent notes tv thank you um erica mastrojani 2017 rosso and 2012 same producer brunello major difference is that the rosso is a bit disjointed loud aromas but lacking body and the tannins stand out yeah so my, my this would be my point about balance the elements haven't yet come together and the lack of aging means that the tannins haven't softened yet. That's a crucial part of that. 
Um, does anyone think, by the way, the acidity on their wine, either wine is standing out? That can be an issue with all red wines when they're young, but especially, of course, with Italians. The Brunello is more harmonious, says Erica. No one thing really stands out, but all the elements together create a fuller body and a more complete wine from start to finish. So Erica, you know, also using the same word complete that Tufi used, which I think is quite telling. Uh, Michelle saying, how do you decide whether dried fruit is tertiary? Either it comes from um, development or oxidative um, from secondary, from winemaking, some, some kind of oxidative aging. Um, yeah, I sort of know what you're getting at. I don't. I would. I would definitely have it though as secondary. I would think that it's, it's a question, um, or even primary. It's a question about either the ripeness of the fruit. Sometimes you get dried fruits in a wine because the ripe the grapes are just overripe in the first place, right? From hot climates, or secondary in the sense of what I was talking about about the oxidative uh, elements of aging, especially Italian wines, can contribute to a, a sense of dried fruits, but not tertiary. I don't think. Um, I don't think it lapses into tertiary, so I say either primary or secondary would be would be good. Um, Rosso 2018, juicy red cherries, anise, dusty tannins and slightly herbal versus the 2012 Reserva Brunello, leather, saddle, saddle leather maybe, <laughs> tart and dried cherry, still powerful, firm tannins, vibrant acidity. So lots of fruit, lots of tannins, lots of acidity, lots of everything, concentrated, good. Um, Lars, Rosso 2017, more linear and one-dimensional um, for the Rosso with good attractive fruit and overlaying oak notes. Uh, the 2014 Brunello has riper fruit, a plush and mid palette of more complexity and has got tertiary notes of leather and smoke and well-integrated tannin and acidity. So the additional aging of the Brunello is what is enabling the tertiary notes to come out. Now, this isn't to say that with further aging, a Rosso might not also develop nice tertiary notes. Absolutely, it can. Um, um, but with the additional aging, you've already, kindly, the winery has already done the aging for you, so you get those nice tertiary notes. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, this goes back philosophically to what the Appalachians think their wines ought to be like. And by mandating long aging, not just in cask, but in bottle before release. So five years after the vintage for Brunello, um, what they're really saying is that we think there should be some notes of age in the wine. If they, were, if they said it just has to be two years in cask, then what they would be saying is we think there should be primary notes and secondary notes, but there doesn't have to be any tertiary notes. But the two years of bottle age as well means there's got to be tertiary notes. So that gets philosophically, there's an interesting statement about what the bodies are indicating about what they think their wine should be like. Um, um, Nupa Fiorita Rosso, juicy red cherries, um, anise and dusty tannins, uh, La Leccia Reserva 2012. Um, yeah, saddle. Uh, and leather and tart, dried cherry, powerful tannins, vibrant acidity and well finish. Very good. Um, Kirsten, 2015 Brunello, more complex, powerful, firm, fine tannins, primary, secondary and some dried fruit. Um, 2012 Rosso, raspberry sour cherry with tertiary notes, um, still has soft, fine tannins. Good, very nice. Um, and Catherine is saying, is it typical for Brunello to use mostly older cask than lots of new oak? There are some producers who are making um, Brunello with French oak barriques, uh, even new ones. But uh, from my perspective, they're getting uh, more unusual. Um, and I would say the majority, maybe the vast majority of Brunello is made in old or large casks, usually very large the same kind of large casks that you'd see in Barolo, in Chianti. Oak, um, the taste of oak, the effects of oak in terms of the oxidative quality that we've been talking about and perhaps VA, those are certainly effects that come from the large oak. But the taste of oak is not something usual, I think, in Brunello. I think the other thing about Brunello, when people talk about modernist um, or more modern producers of Brunello, 
a key part of what they're talking about is not so much about the oak, but about the concentration of the fruit, perhaps a bit more extraction and a bit more velvety textured fruit, as opposed to that kind of dusty, sandy textured Sangiovese fruit that we often think about with the variety. Um, Alice uh, Rosso feels a little tired already. Yeah, so interesting. So that would go back to my critical slide, which is the wine can be very pleasant, but even at a young age, maybe the Rosso doesn't have the stuffing that will enable it to improve any further. The 2015 Brunello is still a baby, packed with juicy, ripe fruit, balanced by rich tannin. So rich, I read as ripe tannin, which is always a good thing, and fresh acidity. Um, very good. Um, so let's just sum up where we're up to before we move on to the next thing. We've looked at the quality advantages that can be given by aging a wine, and we've seen the contrast with wines which are which can be younger. Um, and we've, we've also seen on this slide the risks inherent to assessing quality that sometimes we can get so distracted by, you know, for instance, the tertiary notes that we have to be aware of uh, how good what I'm calling the underlying material is, the fruit, the concentration, all those things. So let's try and draw this together and go back to um, this slide, which we remember from previous weeks. And for each of the wines that you have in front of you today, the champagnes, whether you have one or both, and the Rosso and the Brunello or whatever other Italian wines you have, think about which of the four style categories you would put each one of those wines in. So a simple everyday wine would be A and then B, C, D, down from there. Um, what is What are you gonna go with? Which categories? And again, as a reminder, we're justifying the selection of category by the categories on the left under quality. So for instance, category D, a special wine, would have to have high levels of all those quality characteristics and tick off those boxes at the bottom, the five bottom ones, where you know we're in the world of really excellent wine, where only, you know, only in the world of fantastic wine are those bottom five things um, really worth talking about. So it would have to have all of those things ready to be a category D. So the point I'm making is you can't be a category D, but only have moderate levels of some of the quality aspects. So tell me what categories you would like to put your wines in. And again, everyone's got different wines. There's no right or wrong answers. I'm just kind of interested to make you think seriously about because of the quality aspects, which include all those age notes, which have contributed to the quality, where am I going to end up? With the with a style a style category, um, Toof is just asking a question while you guys are thinking about that. Um, how would you distinguish in a blind tasting a Brunello um, from a Santa Steff, um, both well evolved and of equivalent quality? Uh, interesting question. Um, so the first, I guess the first thing I would look for is um, a difference perhaps. We know that both, you know, in both cases, in the Cabernet and in the Sangiovese, the Brunello wine, you're gonna experience the tannins on the gums. I think even within the gums though, I'd look out for the very frontal tannins, right at the front of the tannins, the focal point in Cabernet wines. Um, and look also for, you know, what I call the tapering going round the gums in the horseshoe shape to the finish in Cabernet. Um, but also about the texture of those tannins. Um, yes, in Brunel, you can certainly get some of the sandiness. Now, with age, the sandiness does become a bit softer. And I think that's probably what you're thinking about, Toothy. And so then you might want to go on to other elements of the wine. Um, in the case of Santa Steph in particular, you want to look for a quite um, almost an aggressive dryness on the finish, like licking a dry stone is what I always think about with Santa Steph. Whereas Brunello, I would hope that the fruit um, and the tertiary complexity would carry it, carry it through a bit more. But Bordeaux overall, more northern climate, drier wine. That would be my overall comment. That's how I would distinguish them. Clearly in both regions, but especially in Bordeaux in that marginal climate, there's more of a vintage variation. Vintage is going to be a very important component of that. But overall, I'm still looking for more ripeness in sunny Tuscany than I am um, in 
Atlantic Bordeaux. Um, so I think you're just looking for a bit of that sun-kissed ripeness as opposed to the slight austerity of the Cabernet. Um, okay, so see what you got. Michelle is trying to do what she did last week and break my categories and add another category. Um, um, Kirsten asking, yeah, what would you, how would you compare the Rioja, a Rioja style wine to a Brunello? Um, I do think a Brunello is almost always bigger than a Rioja. Remember that, you know, as we talked about, aging softens tannins. The tannins on Tempranillo, to my mind, are of a lower level to start with than Sangiovese, at least from Brunello. So even with the softening of the tannins, I still think you're going to get a bigger wine all around with Brunello. I think a better confusion actually would be with Chianti. Um, and in that case, um, I think you're just looking for the location of the tannins on the gums and Sangiovese always, and in the cheeks for the Tempranillo. Um, that would be, those are equivalent body weight wines, but different locations for the tannins. Okay, so let's see what you guys, you're going for the categories. Katia, um, non-vintage champagne, um, it's going to be in category C, good, whereas the vintage is going to be in category D, so really an excellent wine. Um, the Rosso is a simple everyday wine for Katia, um, and Brunello may be D, so a big jump up from the Rosso to, um, to the Brunello for Katia. Um, Edgar, Rosso B, Poggione C, so Edgar's Rosso is a bit better than Kirsten's, um, but maybe the Poggione not quite so good. And the hide sec non vintage would be a B, and the hide sec vintage would be a C, so a serious wine, um, but perhaps not the ultimate in quality. Uh, Nupa non vintage would be C, vintage would be D. Okay, good. So even quite a high level for non vintage. A couple of people have said C for non vintage, so a pretty serious wine. Um, and then a Rosso would be B, whereas a Brunello would be C. Yeah. I mean, the only thing. If you have, some of you have got Reserva, I know you've got Brunello Reserva, but if you put, for instance, Brunello, your Brunello as a D, is it fine to have Brunello Reserva from the same producer also as a D? Um, is it, you know, should we even compare them? If a wine is just great, it's just great in isolation, whether or not there's another wine that's out there from the same producer, or should we think about it in terms of, well, we know that this producer makes a better wine, at least in theory. So it's impossible that this wine could be in the top category. But I don't think there's any reason ultimately why two wines can't be in that top category. Okay, Yvonne Rosso, category two or B. My 2014 Brunello is disappointing, lacks depth and fruit concentration, dominated by acidity and tannins, unsure as to where I've put it. Well, Yvonne, welcome to 2014 in Italy. I was wondering whether someone was going to have a 2014 and make this comment. Now, some of you have got 2014s and you've said they're delicious, which I do not deny. Um, the 2014 is a very tough vintage in large parts of Italy, including in down here in Tuscany. And so I taste a lot of those wines because, in fact, the consortium employed me to do the tasting of 2014 Brunello in New York. And I had to be very polite about the wines. But to be fair to them, the producers were absolutely honest. They said it was the vintage from hell. Um, but we did our best and here's the wines and we think they're nice for immediate consumption but not for aging and they were very honest about it but so 2014s can be a bit thin a bit light lots of acid and like you said lots of tannin maybe a bit dry tannin because it's not ripe tannin um, but the best producers did manage to coax out some fruit even in the vintage like 14. Rosso B and Brunello D for two fee okay good Michelle non-vintage C vintage D uh, Rosso B and Brunello D, good. Um, Erica, Bilka, non vintage is B and the vintage is C. Um, Mastrogianni Rosso is only just a B, um, but the Brunello is very good. That's a D. So interesting, we got some, most people seem to be in Bs for the Rosso, but for the non vintage Champagne, uh, it seems mostly to be a step up to C. Um, some Bs. But then the Brunello, we're getting a lot of Ds for the Brunello, but not so many maybe for the vintage Champagne. Kirsten, non-vintage B, vintage D, Rosso B, Brunello C. Um, Lars saying the Rosso is clearly a B as it's above the pedestrian level of Sangiovese. The Brunello is a C as it does have the building blocks of a serious wine with complexity and a tertiary note 
Um, it does lack in length and in finish. Yeah, I think that's a very good analysis. Lars has really gone to town with these aspects of quality to give a real good answer about why he's selecting the category he is over here. Um, I think that's a great way to think about how to do these final um, assessments of quality and style. Okay, so I've got one final uh, challenge for you. As we can see from the way that we've kind of set this whole thing up, talking about different um, style levels, it's not really appropriate, it doesn't really make sense to say, oh, the Rosso is not as good as the Brunello and therefore we're going to criticize it. Because again, like I've said about style before, different wines are trying to do different things. Um, same with the champagnes. But here's a question for you. If you have two wines that are the same category, e.g. the non-vintage champagne is the same category as the Rosso, or maybe uh, the non-vintage is the same uh, category as the Brunello you have, I want you to compare those two within the same category and tell me which one of them is better. A really interesting challenge. Because if we're going to go and say, well, look, we can't compare things across different style categories because really we're in different territory here. How about ones that are in the same style category? Just because they're wildly different wines, this is a quality assessment, remember? We're assessing quality the whole way through. So why can't we do a quality assessment of wines, albeit very different wines, but which we are saying are of a similar style or of a similar level? So use these categories over here and justify to me, if you like, but to yourself, which one of the wines in the same category is better. Supposing, for instance, you're a wine buyer and you have space for one more wine in your restaurant wine list or in your retail store, and you know you want a wine of category, whichever category it is you're looking at, and you don't really mind which type of wine, but you want to get the best one you can in that category, and you've narrowed it down to these two. Which one are you going to go for? It seems abstract, but I was a retail buyer for a long time, and these kind of questions come up more than you might think. Um, so a comparison within, um, within a category, a style category. The more I do this, by the way, the more I think style is really like a misleading word. I should have called these categories something different because style, you know, a sparkling wine would be a style and an aged red wine would be a style. So maybe it's not the right terminology. So I apologize if it's confusing, but I think you understand what I'm getting at. Um, Katia saying that the vintage 2012 is higher quality than the Brunello. It's more age worthy and complex. So great analysis, Katia, because what you're doing now is you're saying, okay, I know where the wine fits in these categories, um, but even within the category, I'm going to do my hard, analytical, rigorous quality assessment and come out with an answer. Very good. Okay, so in Katia's case, um, the vintage 2012 is higher quality than the Brunello. Um, and Michelle also likes the vintage champagne for the justification that it can age or hold longer. It's more age worthy. Great. Um, and Beverly is asking a very interesting question, the kind of question that I love, which is how do you turn beauty into an objective thing when reviewing these wines? Well, um, Tufi doesn't think beauty should be in my categorization at all because it can't be rigorously assessed. But I've described it in previous sessions as being like an X factor in a wine. Um, there's something which can't be described in any other way other than saying it's beautiful. Now, if you have one wine which you think that applies to, just by saying, oh gosh, what a, this is just a beautiful thing, I can't describe it in any other way, it just is, and the other wine does not have that characteristic, then obviously you're going to come down on the side of the beautiful wine as being superior in quality because it's got an additional layer on top of all the other things. So I think that's clear cut. Now, if both wines seem to have that quality of beauty, then that's when it gets a bit more complicated. Um, but I think there are there can be gradations of um, beauty. Um, certainly, when you taste the very greatest wines in the world, if you've ever been privileged to taste, you know, a whole bunch of Burgundy Grand Cru's together or First Growth Bordeaux's together or whatever, <clears throat> excuse me, then there can be gradations of beauty. All the wines are beautiful; they all have that quality. Um, and it seems mean to pick between them, which is why 
I always feel a bit bad about those kind of exercises because there always ends up being winners and losers. But if you really want to, you can narrow it down. But honestly, if you feel like as long as it ticks off the beauty category, it's there for me, however difficult to define it is, then you don't need to go any further. You can say both these wines are just wonderful. I think that's great. The uh, Brunello is much better than the high 2005, comes closer to hitting that last bullet point of beauty. Good. That's a great justification, Edgar. That's perfect. Um, Nupa, probably the Brunello is better because it's more commercially successful. Um, it will age longer than the non-vintage and has more complexity than the non-vintage champagne, both of which I put in category C. Um, so both non-vintage and the vintage champagne were in the same category, but for uh, reasons of ageability, then the vintage wine is going to win out. Kirsten, the Rosso is better than the non-vintage. It's more complex. Um, the, non the vintage Champagne 2004 is better than the Brunello as it needs more age um, to integrate and soften the tannins. So Kirsten saying it needs more age, but you can flip that on its head and say, will improve further. Um, so it's got more potential. Good. Um, Sunny, I consider both vintage Champagne and Brunello in D category since both have the same high fruit concentration, great harmony across primary, secondary, and tertiary, good integration of oak and tannin for the Brunello and the autolytic components for the Champagne, um, great complexity as evidenced by various descriptors across clusters of aromas, um, and both have well integrated and smooth texture throughout the palate, resulting in a long finish. Yeah, sounds Sounds great, um, Sunny. Those are great descriptions, and I love the way that you're using all the available categories and the evidence. Um, both also have got the potential for further aging and gaining greater complexity. They belong in the same category, despite the different styles. Good, great analysis. Thank you, um, Erica. Comparing the non-vintage with the Rosso, so uh, great comparison to do. The Bilka is better wine. Um, uh, the, yeah, the Bilka, the Champagne is better wine than the Rosso. The Champagne is more complex and less disjointed. It's ready to drink now. Good. Um, Lars, I would place both the non-vintage Champagne and the Rosso in B category as they're both above generic wine in concentration, length and balance. They also have a slightly angular quality um, solidifying the category choice. However, with the reserve wine and the non-vintage Champagne, there's a slightly higher sense of completeness here where the Rosso is more juvenile. Yeah, and I think I love that word complete, which has come up a few times now, because it seems to capture a sense of a wine being successful within its own skin. It's set out to achieve everything that it wants to achieve. Um, remember, I set up these style categories as being, what is this wine trying to be? If a wine is really successful within its style category, I think it's complete. And in this case, Lars is saying, um, that the non-vintage champagne has got a greater sense of that completeness than the Rosso. So I think that's a great justification for choosing the champagne over the Rosso in that case. Okay, so let me uh, just uh, sum up with a, a few final comments. Um, great work, I've worked you hard today, I know. Um, we've kind of turned a lot of these questions on their head a little bit and try to look at things from a slightly different perspective. Um, but you've gr given great, great comments. Um, you've shown great understanding of the wines and all the aspects that go into making up quality. Um, clearly quality, and this is an assumption, like I said at the beginning, on the part of the authorities who set these regulations, but the aging of the wines seems likely to increase quality, especially for those factors which I had outlined um, on the first slide where I was talking about intensity of flavor, complexity of flavor and aroma. Um, and the quality of the finish, as those are complex primary, secondary, tertiary aromas and flavors continue. Um, I do have my word of warning in there about not being distracted by things like the tertiary components. Um, they can be so delicious, but just always beware that um, you shouldn't be distracted um, from the concentration of fruits, the intensity of flavor. Um, the balance, things like that. There's more kind of analytical, slightly less exciting, but very important elements of the wine. As ever, you have to choose a, a correct style context. Um, it's not really appropriate to compare Rosso and Brunello. Um, 
maybe you could make a case for saying it's it's fair to compare non-vintage champagne with vintage champagne. Uh, you can have that discussion, but just make sure that the quality, um, when you're going through these quality assessments, that your mind space is in the correct, you know, style category. That you're making an appropriate judgment on the wine. And one way of doing um, a final analysis of quality between two different levels or categories of wine is to rephrase the question and say which wine is more successful in its own category. Um, if you have a category B wine, a category C wine, if the category B wine is more successful in its category, you could even make the argument that it's a better wine because it's achieving more of what it's setting out to do. So just another way of looking at these quality questions from a slightly different perspective. Um, Okay, so uh, our final session next week on quality will be about winemaking choices and how a winemaker, uh, the choices that he or she makes in the vineyard and in the winery can affect um, not only the final quality of the wine, but as you will not be surprised to hear from all that we've been discussing today, the style of the wine as well. And so we'll talk about how you can assess quality in very different styles of wine. So same time next week. Uh, thank you guys for your great comments today, and I will uh, see you next week. Take care.